remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Genius Travis Cook back with you once again. And since the last time that we spoke to you on YouTube, since the last time we did one of our uh, video shows here, uh, I'm pleased to tell you, I'm pleased to announce that we have expanded around these parts. We have expanded the America's Evil Genius media empire, if you will, into radio. We have a brand new radio show airing each and every week on truthfrequencyradio.com, and that's also on 90.7 FM in Denver. The show airs 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Time every Sunday. That's in the East, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. If you're on the West Coast, Pacific Time Zone, that's 10 a.m. to noon. So depending on what part of the country you're in, it's either brunch time, lunch time, whatever. And we give you your political brunch, if you will. We give you uh, all the news that's fit over the last week and everything looking forward and our own special take on the news of the day, uh, the way that you've come to know and love around here on the YouTube show. We'll still be doing these YouTube shows, of course, but... Uh, certainly, the radio show now at two hours a week is the mothership, and we hope you'll come over and join us. The first two shows have been fantastic so far, and it's only going to get better. That's truthfrequencyradio.com, 90.7 FM in Denver, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. every Sunday on the East Coast, noon to 2 here in the Central Time Zone, 11 a.m. to uh, 1 p.m. in uh, the, the Mountain Time Zone over there in Denver. You can hear it on 90.7 FM, and 10 a.m. to noon over on the left coast. We hope you'll come join us. This week we wanted to talk about um, a topic that I brought up on social media here and there over the last couple of months. And when I bring it up, I always hear a few people that really like the idea, but it kind of goes by the wayside until you get something else that happens. It kind of brings the idea to the forefront again. And when I look back last week, what happened over in France with the Muslim terrorists coming over and, and ambushing and killing those folks over at that uh, magazine, that Charlie Hebdo magazine, and all of the terrorist actions going on. And in France right now, coming out of Yemen, they're saying. And I look at the world yet again, wrestling with the notion, wrestling with the question of, what do we do? How do we handle these Muslim terrorists? How do we most effectively handle them while still sticking to whatever principles we believe we have? As I see that, I see the same question being asked in our society over and over again after every terrorist attack, after every tragedy. I see people asking each and every time, I thought we had it all in order. What do we do now? Well, I'm going to give you a suggestion this week of something we can do, at least here in the United States, that I think will make a pretty big dent in terms of security, a pretty big dent in terms of at least reducing our risk stateside against Muslim terrorists. You know... We've seen these attacks happen over all kinds of different subgroups in the Muslim culture. We've seen ISIS, we've seen Al-Qaeda, we've seen this group, we've seen that group. We've seen them in Iraq, we've seen them in Yemen, we've seen them here, we've seen them there. And it seems like every time we try to fight some of these people, every time we try to bring somebody to justice, we, we cut things a little bit too thin. We, we, we try to get just a little bit too surgical with it. We try, to, we try to look only at the specific little fringe group that executed something and not worry about the entire picture. What I'm suggesting is that we need to start looking at the entire picture. Whether we want to admit it or not, and there's a good number of people in America and certainly around the world who do not wish to admit it, but whether we want to admit it or not, this war that America is in, that the world is in, is not with a particular nation state. The war that the world is in is not with a particular subgroup of radical Islam or Islamic extremists. Boy, I wish I, I wish people would stop using the word extremist and, and defining that, by the way, because the word extremist is not a dirty word, as you hear at the top of this program. Extremism can be a good thing. So extremism is not what we should be fighting. But the Middle Eastern culture and Islam is what we should be fighting. And yes, to a significant degree, the religion of Islam is very much tied up within Middle Eastern culture. You cannot fight that culture without also fighting that religion. That's a very difficult thing for some people to get their heads around. It's a very uncomfortable thing for some people to realize. But you've got to understand that here in the West, we're virtually the only people in the world that understand the concept or believe in the concept of 
okay, you've got your society and then you've got your religion over here. You've got your political uh, structure over here and your religion over there. We're the exception, not the rule. And, and, and I know that they say in America we have separation of church and state and the Constitution. That's not exactly true. There's a lot of debate over that. But in any case, we as a society have sort of grown to accept that separation, whether rightly or wrongly. So when we suggest that you've got to fight every part of Muslim culture, including the religion, that makes some people very uncomfortable. But I don't see any way around it. We're constantly told that there are good Muslims out there, but it's, it's harder and harder to find those that come out and fight against the bad Muslims. You've got to think that, okay, maybe most of them are bad and maybe a lot of them are just uh, advocating by silence, as it were. So what do we do? If we accept in America that fighting the culture and fighting the religion are necessary. How does one do that in a society that has freedom of religion? How does one do that in an American society that quite frankly allows you to worship whatever religion you wish or not worship at all if that's what you choose to do? How do we do that? Because we, we can very easily go into an academic discussion and talk about people's rights and their liberties and, and our, their freedoms and so forth and that's all well and good but at the same time, you also have to have a pragmatic discussion about survival. So are there things we need to do in order to take care of this issue that's got a knife across all of our throats that might be in contradiction to some of our rights and some of our uh, freedoms and so forth? And if so, what would those be? Well, clearly, if Congress passed a law tomorrow outlawing the Islamic religion in the United States, it would not work. First of all, it's very difficult to get it done, but let's say, for discussion's sake, let's say that the House passed a law banning Islam, the Senate passed the same law, it went to the president, and the president signed that law. Granted, I don't think this president would sign that law, but let's say we had a reasonable president who would actually sign that type of law. Sounds great, but you and I both know that it still wouldn't stand up because at some point it would go to the Supreme Court, it would get overturned on a constitutional basis and speaking strictly in constitutional terms, rightly so. So understanding that in this case, the constitution sort of works against us instead of for us, how do you deal with this? What do you do? Passing a law banning Islam won't work. It'll just get struck down in the courts. So what do you do? There is one other option. Instead of passing a law that bans Islam in America, bans the practice of Islam, we could ratify a constitutional amendment that bans Islam. Now think about that for a second. That's something people don't talk about very much on this subject or anything else. You very rarely hear people actually talk these days about introducing constitutional amendments and ratifying them. And for a good reason. It's a very long and arduous process. It's a very high bar to get it done. It takes a long time. It's not easy. If you think it's hard to get a law passed through Congress, that's nothing compared to what it takes to ratify a constitutional amendment. But there are benefits to ratifying a constitutional amendment. Because I told you that the problem with just enacting a law that banned Islam was that it would be declared unconstitutional. But if you go through the process of ratifying a constitutional amendment and it jumps through the hoops, it gets ratified, it becomes part of the Constitution, then that amendment, by definition, can never be ruled unconstitutional by any court. Even if that amendment is in conflict with other amendments or other parts of the Constitution. Remember that prohibition was enacted by a constitutional amendment and it was repealed by another constitutional amendment that contradicted it. So that's how you work within the Constitution. You propose amendments, you ratify them, that sometimes will conflict with other amendments in the Constitution or other pieces of the Constitution. That's what I'm suggesting we do here. I am suggesting a constitutional amendment that bans the practice of Islam, bans Islamic mosques, bans that society, and bans that religion in America in perpetuity. And if it's an amendment, it can never be ruled unconstitutional by the courts. It would be set in stone whether people like it or not. Now, as I say, it's not an easy process. The last amendment of the Constitution that was ratified in America was the 27th Amendment. That happened back in 1992. And it certainly was not a short process. The 27th Amendment took 202 years, 7 months, and 12 days to ratify. Now, granted, that's on the high end. 
Clearly, not every amendment took 200 years to ratify. Otherwise, how would the other 26 have been ratified? But it does take a while in some cases. By the way, that 27th Amendment, that was an amendment that prohibits congressmen from enacting pay raises during their own term. So in other words, under the 27th Amendment, if a, if a Congress votes itself a pay raise, it doesn't take effect until the next term after an election. Which means that it took us over 200 years in America to get our congressmen to not be able to vote pay raises for themselves during their own term. Wow. Anyway, all of that aside, yes, it's a high bar. Yes, it's tough to do. And yes, that's intentional. We don't want to willy-nilly you know, amend the Constitution or every little old thing. But it seems to me that this is a case where it's needed. This is a case where we are at war with a religion. As hard as that is for some people to believe, as difficult as, as it is for some people to admit, we are at war with Islam in this country and in Western civilization. The only way around that, the only way to keep it from taking root in America, the only way to keep what happened in France from happening here is to eliminate that culture and, yes, eliminate that religion. And when you think about it, what is the downside to Islam being eliminated or at least severely marginalized in America? If by some means that could happen, what would be the downside to it? How would America suffer if Islam were banned? I literally can't think of anything negative that would come from that. There's literally no downside in America to banning Islam. Absolutely none. Now granted, those who are Muslim have would have several choices. They could leave the country. They could convert to Christianity. All of those things are on the table. But we're at war with their religion. Their religion has declared war at us. We didn't ask for it, but we're in it. And I don't see any other way around it for our survival than to ban the religion of Islam forever in America. And that can only be done via a constitutional amendment. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius, Travis Cook. Remember, join us on TruthFrequencyRadio.com each and every Sunday. We will see you next time.